Hello and welcome to another episode of React Native Radio. I'm your host, Nader Dabit. Today on our panel, we have Spencer Carley. Hello. Peter Pykarczyk. What's up, everybody? And today our special guest is, and I'm going to completely screw his name up, so I'm going to ask him to re-say his name, Walter Vandenbroek. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Nader. I think it's almost good, so it's Walter Vandenbroek. And it's Dutch, yes. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Infinite Red is a US-based consultancy specializing in React and React Native. They do mobile app and web design and development. They are deeply involved in the React and React Native open source communities, publish the React Native newsletter with 10,000 subscribers, and are involved with the React Native core development. If you have a project and need design or engineering help from an experienced team to take it all the way from concept to completion, get in touch with Infinite Red. Also check out Chain React, the React Native conference, which is hosted by Infinite Red in July in Portland with 500 developers from all around the world. You can find them at infinite.red. Make sure to mention you heard about them in this ad. Well, I know you from Twitter and I've met you a couple of times, um, but people that are listening may not know you. So can you give us a quick introduction? Sure, I'm a freelance mobile and web developer already since 2000, or around 2000, so I, I'm already doing that. Um, like I said, I'm from the Netherlands, so my name is really Dutch. Uh, and I'm wor working with and on React, uh, I think the last two, two and a half years. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, and I'm, like I said, I'm freelancing and consulting most of, the, most of my working days. Awesome. Well, thanks again for coming on. And I think today we're going to be having a topic centered around um, remote working, but really, um, I guess, centered around distributed teams and like what's the difference between distributed teams and working remotely. So can you kind of talk about why you kind of like what you have to bring to the table in this conversation is the company that you work with? Do you all have a distributed team? Yeah, most most companies I, I'm 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 from are in distributed teams because if they if they don't or and remote, yeah, the discussion then later on what what is what. But uh, if you um if you work uh, with a lot of clients that don't uh, accept in that sense remote work or distributed team member, then it doesn't work. So then you're usually you're off in a month because the culture on that side isn't uh, yeah really uh, hands on with the remote and distributed teams uh, mentality in that sense. And then it doesn't work and you need to uh, say goodbye after a short while because yeah, you cannot do your work and they are usually really upset <laughs> that some parts are not, are not done or et cetera. And usually it is also a trust issue uh, that they have uh, that if you are not on in the office that they, that they don't know what you're working on or what you're working on. And then, of course, you get a lot of questions, etc. So, uh, but first, I think that the main thing is what is uh, what is the difference between the distributed teams and the remote uh, and remote workers. I think the difference isn't really that grand or uh, that much. I think uh, with a distributed team, I think you have the most the vast majority of people uh, you interact with in your team are not near or not, not near you at all and of, and they don't see the same office so if you have an office job and you go to the office one time a week or two times a week and the rest of the week you're at home and the rest of the team for example is, is at the office then it's more a remote uh, part of the job which is great of course uh, but with the distributed team you don't yeah you, you really don't see each other in in Real life that much usually maybe once a year is, is a lot for most some companies so that's that's a real uh, real difference yeah when i think yeah. of uh, remote i think of a person sitting at home or at a coffee shop like just working wherever they work and then distributed teams to me feels more like you have uh, a company and they have offices in like different cities and like wherever you live you go into that office and your teams are still like coming together to work together but they're not all in the exact same place or something like that. Yeah, that, that, that's what you see with with with, with, uh, with large companies, of course, like uh, with Google, Facebook, and I think them as well. It's like that that they have teams for one specific uh, task, and they put them together in one city. That's usually what you see. So I don't think I, I don't think that's a different team in my, in my opinion, because of course they are all together and working on one uh, same task or product. 
Uh, with distributed teams, you have a lot of members spread it around the world. And of course, they, they have an office because every business has an office and, and you must have an office these days. And some people are at that office maybe, but maybe it's one or two. And the rest of the team, like 14 or 15 people is in, in, the, in the rest of the world. And even in the totally different uh, time zones like America or Asia. So then you have like 40 hours of uh, 24 hours uh, people at at your oh, at your uh, at your disposal in that sense, and working at your product. So I think I think that's that it is a difference how you uh, interact with people and how you interact uh, with uh, with with your colleagues uh, in in uh, in, in the, that matter respect. I've got a question for sure. for the. I think this could work for uh, all all three of you too. But um, how do you manage? Uh, like getting a Slack notification in the off hours. Uh, do you feel pressured to answer it? Uh, what do you do in those situations? Good question. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I work remotely for a big, large corporation, and we have a we have an internal chat, and we also have, or I'm also part of Slack and Discord. So I'm like, you know, but of course, some of these are considered work and some of them aren't. As far as the internal chat for uh, for Amazon that I'm part of, we get notifications sometimes on the weekends and after hours, but there's never, ever any um, like sense of urgency to to respond to those types of messages. I personally am the one sending those messages sometimes because I'm screwing around on the weekends a lot of times building stuff <laughs> because that's what I like to do. And I'll I'll have a question that I've. I'm not sure if I'll remember like on Monday and I'll just post it in the, in the, in the room, but there, there's no, there's no sense of urgency there. Like if it's during the week um, and even during the week, I don't think there's a sense of urgency for most things, unless it's like a direct message maybe. But if it's just in a room, like unless someone, unless I, if I really want an answer, a uh, question answered, I'll like at, at, I'll like at Richard, Hey, you know, like come check this out or something. But other than that, like at least at my company, there isn't any, uh, requirements to answer on the weekends or after hours. Uh, I was just going to say, from a freelancing perspective, something um, I've learned over the last, really I've kind of implemented this over the last year, is when I'm starting a new project with a client, I kind of give them a heads up, like, these are my working hours. This is when you can expect responses from me, kind of after hours, notifications or messages. Like, I may get to them that evening or that morning, you know, if it's at 6 a.m. or something. Um, I may get to it, you know, within 15 minutes, but I just try to set that expectation ahead of time that I'm typically not working at those times. I probably won't respond till I'm back in the office, which is just a room in my house. But uh, that's just something that I found from a freelancing perspective, just like these are my hours. I may or may not respond outside of them. Spencer, question for you as a yeah. consultant. Um have you ever gotten pushback or some like passive aggressive sort of like, oh, yeah, that's fine. But then still have maybe like the leader on the team who brought you on, like hitting you up because they're the like, has anybody ever tried to get you to answer outside of those hours? Oh, hell yeah. I mean, I had one client who we just recently rented out, ended our relationship on good terms. But, you know, they were a team that did a lot of all nighters. Uh, so I would get like, wake up to 20 messages and they're going to like 3 AM. And like, I, there's a pushback that like, you know, we need your help, blah, blah, blah. It's super urgent, which I put in air quotes cause nothing's that urgent. Um, and like, that's just a hard line in the sand that I'm just like, I'm not willing to give up on my sleep cause I'm not a nice person. When I don't get my sleep. So, um, yeah, that's just, Definitely there's there's pushback, but I think that's one of those things you just kind of got to feel out when you're at the start of that relationship. <clears throat> yeah, I, th I think the, 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 uh, we, at, at the, some clients I work with, of course, so I, we usually call that communication rhythm because there must be a rhythm like, and like office hours is also a great rhythm in that sense. So communication must doesn't need to follow the same rules all at the same time, but it has to have a rhythm in that sense uh, to to and when you and when you cannot uh, answer or post some questions or whatever or uh, when 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 to uh, get a response. 
And for, for Slack, I don't. I, I think uh, I think Peter Steinberg from uh, PSPDF Kit had a nice talk about how they had the, because it's an, a distributed team company. Uh, they had uh, some Slack rules and some Slack settings, which are re- which I find really useful, and I'm using them as well. That I'm not getting every getting every message or pop-ups or whatever. Uh, and they have some nice rules to uh, say what is urgent, what is not. Uh, so I really like that that one as well. And if and if it's urgent, I usually say then call me. Like there's still a mobile phone or whatever. There is a phone <laughs> you can answer. And if I and if I take it up, then you know I'm there for you. And and if I'm not taking uh, the phone call, then I'm usually I'm doing something else. So and nothing is urgent that, that urgent that it, that that it brings down the house usually. So that's a good one too. The calling right. If it's that urgent, then call me. I feel like there's. There's a threshold on Slack where somebody could maybe disrespect your free time, but it takes a lot for a human to call you, right? Yeah. Now you've now you've elevated or escalated the interaction, right? And like there are some things that people will say over Slack because they forget that there's a human being on the other end, right? But hearing somebody's voice is a nice reminder that, hey, this is a human being and, you know, like, uh, it takes a lot to kind of go over that hump, right? True, and also the the the, the way you, people sound on the phone or talking to you. That's then you know how if things are urgent or not. If somebody is really cold, it isn't urgent. <laughs> if somebody is panicking, then you know there's something really wrong <laughs> on the other end of the phone, and maybe we should fix it. So, yeah, yeah, and to extend on that a little bit, like. You can also get some context of what's going on in the person you're calling their life at that moment. Maybe they're at their kid's sport, soccer game or they're making dinner right now. Like oh. you, you get that awareness of what's going on rather than just kind of sending off a message quickly without thinking about it, talking on the phone. You hear what, what's going on in their life in that background that you know they're thinking about as well at that moment. Yep. Yeah, I mean, this might be kind of harsh, but if you're working at a company where you're expected to answer questions after hours or, or on the weekends, except in rare occasions, you might want to like find another company to work for. <laughs> I mean, unless you're like, you know, I don't know. I mean, like, of course, unless it's like, you know, you're getting paid like a million dollars a year or something. And it's in the, in the agreement, like you're going to have to like be on call 24 seven, but even at AWS, like where people are on call, it's only at certain times, you know, of, the year really per you know per org like there'll be a few people and it's only at certain times and and they're getting paid a lot to do that um if you're just like an engineer somewhere and um it's not like you know you're not getting paid a ton of money like you shouldn't like have to do that type of stuff like of course if there's an emergency you're working in a startup your you know your ceo like calls you hey man like you know something serious happened like and that happens once in a while i think that's fair but other than that i think i think that's kind of like you know something you shouldn't have to deal with. Yeah. Something interesting I think about remote working and and my, this might also kind of like go along with the idea of um, uh, distributed teams is how specialized I think that the engineering, you know, is getting in, in front and back in development and software engineering in general and how hard it is to actually find people to work on specific problems if you don't, have uh, remote people you know if you if you have an office in maybe san francisco or new york or, or one of the few really big tech cities it's easy to probably or it's possible to find someone to work on your exact problem but if you're in any other city in the world like even cities like chicago i'm sure or houston or um, bigger cities outside of the u.s you know if you if you have a certain specific problem that you need to be solved chances are there might be like less than 100 people in the world that can solve that problem and the chances of them being available and in your city, you know, all like all of these things, like actually falling into place are rare, having the option for remote team, like allows you to bring on those, those types of like, you know, high performing individuals, no matter where they are, you know, and I think you're going to, I think that's, that's a reason that I think we're seeing more and more companies become open to remote workers. Yeah, it's, it's a, it's a, sometimes it's a necessity. So yeah. So so, but like I said, the company must must uh, support it in, in, in any way possible because if the, if the culture isn't there, like like I said, and and then you're 
they, that may want to do remote because they want that they want that worker uh, for that specific job, but they don't they don't have their processors and their communication and their tools uh, on or, in order to 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 support your your work, and then you get really agitated <laughs> because you can you cannot do your job, and of course they cannot get their value out of you. So some men, not all. Con- Companies, but a lot of companies don't support it in in the in the right way and cannot support the distributed teams although they want to. So that's that's uh, always a, a thing. When I first uh, do a client, usually I'm asking about this, like um, because I do remote all the time, uh, asking them how their culture is and uh, if it supports uh, remote working. And of course, they say usually they say yes, and at the end sometimes it is no because. The managers want to micromanage you at, at every corner. Uh, there is no trust at your end to, to, to do the right thing, and then at the end of the month, you're yeah, you're not going anywhere, and there that you didn't deliver what you what you wanted to because you were always on the phone or whatever to get everything moving. So it is ground that it can that we can on the internet these days. Uh, we can do it, uh, do remote work, but yeah, the company must. My, in my opinion, must support it in, in all means because otherwise it won't work. Yeah, that brings up a good point. So I live in a somewhat smaller city, uh, Nashville, Tennessee. Like I think there's around a million or you know between 750,000 a million people. And looking at React Native specifically, like there is a demand here, but I'm finding that the market's a little bit tapped out. Like the people who know React Native have experience with React Native, don't necessarily uh, or a lot of them are hired out doing their own thing and recruiters are trying to find people to fill these roles. And there's a little bit of a lag, I think, in being open to, uh, remote work here. So with that in mind, like how could a company who, you know, they have that, the need for developers for react native specifically, for example, and they're, they're finally at the point where like, okay, we're open to going remote. How could they, start implementing systems to like make remote work work for both the you know the developer and the company for these managers who are used to seeing developers or seeing their employees working how do we kind of like bridge that gap between more traditional models and moving more towards adopting remote yeah that's a good, that's, that's a good question uh, i think what i what i saw in the field the, uh, and what i see these days usually when it goes wrong there's a lot of uh, knowledge and a lot of things that are in the company but not written down or noted anywhere. So it's, nobody knows what what uh, situations are right or wrong or what what must be done or not. So it is a lot of process and knowledge transfer, as, as we call it, from one person to another, which must be done before you can do remote work because then if you have everything on paper, then Everybody knows what, what what to do, of course, but also what's needed in every aspect of the of the role you are playing in the in the company, but also in a, uh, what role other people have in in, in the company. And then with uh, the great communication tools, of course, we have these days. Then, of course, it is a small gap to to do the communication, but you cannot overdo it because of, of, uh, otherwise, like I said, you're always on the phone or on Slack or on email because you have to say everything out loud every time again and again. So the, the, the knowledge transferring that uh, that respect is really, really, really important because otherwise, yeah, you get the same question over and over and over again. So I think um, that's what most companies don't have is a, a solid base of everything documented. Everything is there to be seen by everyone eventually. Uh, and everybody knows what the role of another people or another person is, and they also know that there is another person because I had one client. I was there, I think, for four weeks, and they didn't even know that I was there. So yeah, that's really ridiculous, of course, but that happens because they didn't say to anybody or they didn't communicate that I was working on uh, uh, on their project as well. So, but and yeah, I was trying to get uh, get communication across, but they didn't. So yeah. I think those parts, like uh, the, the the really solid documentation and good process and communication, I think that's yeah that's key. How do you think a business or a startup, you know, can start thinking about those things early on? 
Uh, we are a young company, right? We've been around for almost two years. We are like constantly running around and trying to improve our product, but we also want to respect our coworkers time. Are there any resources that a founder like myself can look at, uh, to kind of start thinking about those things? You know, now, so when we do have a bigger culture, it'll be easier to, you know, head in that direction instead of this like negative, you know, direction that, that I feel like maybe, maybe people don't want to head that way, but just happen to head that way. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. That, 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 that's also a good question. I think, I think get, get going is of course the, 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 the main key thing. And uh, of course there are a lot of tools. Uh, everybody uh, knows like Confluence and Jira, and, but there are also some other tools like Rexium, uh, which we use for retrospects uh, in, in, in our team. Uh, and of course there's uh, we have, like we said, Slack, et cetera. But I think for, for the documentation part, uh, usually what we, what we try to do or what our clients try to do is to get everything, literally everything on paper or on in Confluence or in other, another document system, you pick one and it's fine. Uh, and not only the, the technical, because that's usually what we see is the technical side, but also the, uh, the, the culture side of things or the goals we have, the, 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 the metrics we have, the, and what is what is what is something you are doing and something your colleague is doing and what are the goals when with with that role? Uh, I think uh, GitLab has, uh, which is an, also a distributed team company, uh, has everything online. Everything, everything, every role, everything they do, they they they, they put online. They have documented it, and so if you uh, if you do a job interview there, you know what's 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 there you know what colleagues are there before you go there which is really great because of course you know which persons and which roles that are in in the company and what's which roles what what key metrics there are for that role which what knowledge is needed for that which tools they use etc etc so i think if you if you can try to do that immediately get everything or everything and of, of course it's not uh, immediately right or you know, 100%, but if you do so, then I think and you get a really plus side if you take somebody in from, from abroad, and he knows English, of course, <laughs> then, he, uh, then he can really quickly see what's going on in your company and not, not by, do, by getting there in the office, but just by reading. Yeah. That's a really good point. Uh... I like the GitLab model too. I've actually been through that myself, the handbook, just trying to figure out how, you know, how we could uh, relate into that. And there were parts of me that were wondering if all something like that should be open for a small business, right? So it's not, you know, it's not like somebody's reading into it and being like, ooh, like this is what they're doing because they omitted this or, you know, like mm -hmm. somebody, right? So do you have any suggestions for how that could possibly be uh, be balanced, maybe? Uh, maybe the uh, GitLab is, is, is really, really open. Eh? They, they, well, like you said, the playbook is, I, I found it great, but maybe it's not for you to to open it yeah, for everyone. But I think if you do it yeah, I, I, with, with, with uh, big companies as well, with client, big company, the clients I have, they have a playbook as well, but they, they don't put it on the internet. They just have their internet or they have even a PDF or whatever, and they send it to you to get uh, to get that uh, read through. And then if you are communicating and there are a lot less more questions about all the rules, etc. So I, I, it doesn't need to be open. It's just if you put it down somewhere and you, and you let it grow, I think then, yeah, it, it, it is there to read for, for for everyone or just a few persons or you or you start with the, the founders or the the, the 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 people who define that culture in 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 in, in, uh, in that in that startup or whatever uh, company you have i think that that's 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 a good beginning and then just gradually go uh, go with it and make it bigger and bigger because i think uh, uh, PSPDF kit uh, or Steve did also, or Peter Stan Steinberg did also uh, say that in his talk or in different talks. I and then when I talked to him, it was that part is the most most diff difficult part to get right, of course, but also the most important one 
because yeah, that's what defines you, you as a, as a company and you as a person. So that's good to know. That's really good advice. I'm asking these questions because I'm in the middle of trying to build a good culture, you know, and now that we are, we're sort of at this point where we are considering hiring remote, uh, uh, folks, but we've also never done it before. And it's not that we don't want to, we just want to set those people up for success, right? Yeah. So there's a little bit of thought and practice that has to go into that. You know, even things like uh, conversations that take place in the office during the day, right? Uh, do the remote uh, folks feel, would they feel left out if a conversation took place in person, right? Like, just like getting the team to sort of focus on having those conversations on Slack rather than, rather than in, yep. in person. What's, what's your perspective on, on all that, right? Like if there is like an office somewhere. And that's, and that's fine, of course. Like I said, there, there must be an office, so that's, that's fine. But what, what I try to do with clients is like if you, if you have a meeting and you're the only – and sometimes I was the only one uh, remote, which is not really distributed team, but if you are one of the only ones who are remote – we always do uh, the meeting with everyone on a computer. So everyone is on Zoom or Skype or whatever. Although they are in the same office, I don't care because then you have the same difficulties and the, because that's the thing, of course, and the same boundaries uh, as, the, as, as me or as the one who is remote. So that's what you usually do. And, instead, and indeed, if, if there is a question, just put it on Slack or whatever your medium is where you would put your questions instead of doing it uh, and doing it in the office or one on one or in a, or all in small talk. Of course, small talk can exist. Like uh, that's uh, that's not the problem. But if it's all, if it's work related, just put it down in Slack or whatever tool you use. Uh, even if you're two feet away, <laughs> it doesn't matter. Yeah. This episode is brought to you by TripleByte. Applying to programming jobs sucks. You have to put the right keywords in your resume, you spend hours and hours on the phone screens and take home projects, and that's assuming the company even responds to your application. Well, if you're a software engineer, TripleByte can help. They work with over 400 top tech companies from big names like Dropbox and Adobe to exciting startups. You do one brief online interview with them, and if you do well, you go straight to final interviews with the company on their platform. It's like the common app for software developers. TripleByte does not look at your resume or where you went to school. All they care about is if you can code. I've helped dozens of software developers with various credentials get jobs, and this looks like a terrific way for you to get in and get interviewed and get a job without a lot of the hassle and overhead. You can go check them out at triplebyte.com slash reactradio. That's triplebyte.com, byte as in eight bits. As a special offer for listeners of this show, if you take a job through TripleByte, they'll offer you a $1,000 signing bonus. Yeah, that's what we started doing at the company I worked at prior to freelancing. I was, I think, the first or second remote employee. Um, and something that was something that was a bit of an issue is just kind of like getting up to speed on those like little conversations that people have that kind of alter, you know, the daily to do list or whatever it may be. And uh, what they ended up implementing was they got some camera system at kind of the primary meeting table because it was a relatively small company. And they had like one meeting room slash area and all the meetings would happen in that area. And however they had the system set up, I never actually learned how they set it up, but it was just a press of a button or something to start a Zoom meeting, could easily send that link or put it into Slack for whoever would be interested in that. Um, and basically by doing that, even if remote people weren't necessarily joining, it kind of built that muscle memory into uh just kind of like set things up to include the remote people in a conversation if necessary. And then also it just kind of taught everyone how to quickly and easily set up this remote system or, you know, setting up the meeting because there is that, uh, that sticking factor of, Oh, I've got to set a meeting up, got to send it to Slack, all this kind of stuff. Um, yeah, maybe if you want to get real nerdy, kind of like setting up a Zapier zap to do that shit automatically. So you don't have to think about it. Just have a, that was easy button to do it. But yeah, that was something that we we implemented that I found beneficial as a remote employee was just like quick meetings, just have it really easy to set up those remote calls that people could easily gain access to. Sounds like a good solution, yeah. So Peter, so I'll put you on the spot here. Are you going to start hiring remotely or what? <laughs> yeah, we've been considering it. 
we just don't want to fuck it up. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, you know, let's, so this might be a good segue into talking about the negatives or, or also the upfront costs associated with having a remote team because you can't just start having a remote team. You have to have like things in place for onboarding and things uh, because they're not going to be able to be in the office and be able to just like walk next door and say, hey, you know, like, this question, this question, and that question, you kind of like with, uh, at least with Amazon, which is like, you know, you can't even probably compare that to most companies. They're a massive company. They have uh, employees all over the world. There's a really vast, vast, uh, uh, like online infrastructure for, for, you know, employees to go on and find all the information they need. I couldn't imagine building that for a startup. So like when startups do do remote workers, you know, there's a lot of upfront cost. I'm sure, as far as like, you know, getting all of the information that new employees need, you know, how, how are the processes work and all that stuff, payroll, all those things, you know, the, so that would be part of the upfront cost. And then, and then I'm, I'm, I'm just assuming that like, there are other things there that are like negatives, but I don't really know what those would be, but maybe you all could like chime in on that. Yeah. I mean, for starters, you know, I'm sure like Amazon has teams bigger than draft it as a whole that just focus on building internal tools and like all those things. And like, you know, there are tools like Asana and Airtable and, you know, whatever, but uh, you really have to, you know, like commit to it, right? Like you have to put a process behind it. Otherwise it's easy to fall off the wayside. So we do have a person in charge of that right? Making sure that we stay on top of like updating our sprints, updating documentation or whatever, but it's still, it's still tricky uh, to do. You know, even now we have some remote contractors. Uh, I have to remember to, you know, like loop them in when like certain engineering tasks are taking place or uh, update documentation where we feel like it's, it's falling short because these people work in a different time zone, right? and have have different hours and have no idea like what that whole drafted ecosystem looks like no that, that's that i think i think i think a contractor is, is a great way to get into it because like you said like you are saying it's like and they don't know it they don't know anything about you and your company and they, they they need to be on board as well and then of course you don't have the uh, mainly the the, the how do you call it? The uh, the the paywalling, etc. You don't have to do that for a contractor immediately. So that's that's the fine thing. You know, the juristic way you can put that behind you or do it later. Uh, so the the uh, you but the documentation, like you are saying, that's the main the main thing. Uh, and I think it's the same way like we discussed uh, earlier. Is if you do uh, a meeting and and you do remote, then and let everybody do it. It's the same thing with this. It's like with code reviewing or with with uh, communication. Is just keep just do it. it make it the standard uh, that uh, this is the same for remote workers. So if you are at the office, you do it the same way as as you do for a remote worker. So it must fit them all at once because otherwise you are going two lanes, and of course two lanes doesn't work at all. Uh, so everything you do with every every tool you use, just Take in mind that uh, somebody is at the other end, you don't see, you don't know, or whatever. And then, and then if you do that process with everything you do, then usually you get it right. Not, not the first time, of course, <laughs> but I guess the second or the third time it will uh, it will be fine. Yeah, something yeah, else. Makes... I... Oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Sorry, go ahead. All right. Yeah, I was just going to say something that I've seen, um, and this was more when I was an employee of a company that did remote or had remote developers. Uh, that was kind of a downside as a remote employee was just the the lack of a relationship you build with your coworkers uh, because you don't see them walking into the office or like walking out having a quick conversation. So it's a much more formal relationship with people, which has its pros and cons. But that is something that I noticed that um, was kind of a bummer. Like you, you didn't build that same sort of friendship with the people you work with day in and day out. So something that I found really valuable and really, really fun uh, was like, because it was a smaller company, we had to, you know, keep it yearly. But when we would fly the entire team in uh, to one central location, just kind of like hang out for the week, get work done, kind of view the company vision as a whole. 
and just like get to BS with the people we would work with day in and day out, but we haven't seen for the last eight months uh, was always a really, really good thing. And something towards the end of working at that company that they were doing was uh, bringing in smaller teams. So like we were a consultancy, we had, you know, some number of clients that we would work on a team with. And I think they started bringing in individual teams to get together and hang out at a, you know, rent a house on Airbnb for a week, uh, just to get that one team of six people together, hang out, building that relationship. And I think all of us, it was, it was just like a big party for the week. So it was always really fun to do. And just, it, it grows relationship, which I think always contributes to better work as well. I think, I think so as well. And I think, but I, I don't think you need a company retreat uh, for that because with most of the clients we have, a, also we have a daily stand up like, like most people do. Also, and if we do your remote, we you just do it with your Zoom or, or Skype or whatever. And usually what we try to do is to get also uh, some informal conf- conversation going before or after the meeting uh, to see how, how everybody's doing and, and picking some interest and interesting topics from, from, for people. And some people will drop off like they do at the office and some people will stay like for 10 minutes and just say whatever they, what their weekend was, for example. And I think... I think uh, Infinite Red did it as well. Is they they do a movie night or uh, in, in in Skype, which is great because you get a, to see a movie, of course. But you have you you are with remote workers in 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 a team and just look at a movie and discuss it if you want to or uh, afterwards. And so that was also a great thing I saw with uh, with with them. Is like they try to do the the informal things as well uh, through uh, the of course through the means they have. So, yeah. Yeah, I think the one thing that I've noticed the most about working remotely over the last year, year and a half um, with a team that's located in Seattle is that I do miss that camaraderie and I do miss like being able to talk and hang out with people that are working on the same stuff as me. I have a little office in Mississippi and I'm like by myself most of the time, you know, writing code. I communicate with everybody online, but it's not the same as being there. Um, it, I love now, like my favorite part about traveling now is actually being able to like, hang out with the people that I work with or that I have things in common with. Whereas um, right now I'm sitting here in my office in Mississippi and I'm kind of like by myself this week. So (laughs) that brings up a great point though, about one of the benefits of remote work is like, you know, Natter, you and I, I think we can both relate to this being that like cost of living in Mississippi and Tennessee is so much lower than uh, either of the coasts or even Chicago. I'm sure like, that's one of the, oh man, I love, love that about remote working. It's just like the cost of living compared to going to San Francisco's. Oh, it's great. Yeah, it is. It's crazy. I mean, the difference is, is, is hard to even like put into like, it's hard to even explain because like when you're in New York or, or Seattle or San Francisco, and maybe you've been there for a while, you get used to like living in like small spaces and people having like, you know, kind of small and and that's fine like you know like depending on what you want out of life like maybe that's exactly cool with you and that's what you like but when you're in mississippi or i'm sure even in tennessee even in nashville which is probably becoming more expensive but it's still going to be way cheaper you know for the for less than what people are paying for a one bedroom and some of these other places you can buy like a very nice uh roomy house with like land and like be out you know uh, like in the country and only maybe a 20 minute drive from your office or maybe you work at home. Um, so that's kind of like, yeah, one big difference and just the general cost of living overall. So I think like, you know, if that's your thing, if you like to have, you know, a little bit of room and you're, you don't like to be in an apartment, you know, nailing a job that pays what you would make while you're living in the big city, but allows you to live elsewhere. Like to me, that's like badass if you can do that. <laughs> <laughs> And I, th- I think the productivity is also higher, I guess, if you're on your own. You know, it depends. Like some people, you know, say it is. Some people say it isn't. For me, I don't see like a huge difference. Like I feel like I'm very productive either way, but I feel like some people would be less productive or more productive. And, and I think it kind of depends on your personality. Sure. I've noticed that um, if I work literally from my home, I'm not that productive. But I, if I leave my house and go to an office – even if I'm by myself, like I, I'm pretty productive. But you know, I also have kids and, I, and a wife, and you know, a, a yeah, million things to do: video games, like a fridge <laughs> full of food, and 
you know, there's too many distractions at home. Yeah, that's yeah. that's that's definitely true if you're if you're working from home because, uh, like I said, remote isn't the same as uh, from home, of course. Uh, and and I have I have an office at home, so that's really grand, of course, because then you have an, a different space than your uh, than your home is. Uh, but if you work at home, you have some you have to define. That's what I had when I when I started in two thousand or something. And I met my wife and I got a kid, then yeah, you need to define some rules. <laughs> what can and cannot be done when you're when you're at work or when you're working. And so what we what we did at my home is we, we put on a stop stop sign at my door. And when it's when it was on, nobody must enter. And if then it was off, you can just enter and just talk to me. And of course, the first two times it gets wrong, and then you get angry, etc. And then after that. Usually it goes really well and just put up a sign and then everybody knows, even the little kid knows, okay, that is it work. <laughs> don't, let me, don't let me to enter because otherwise I have some furious dad at my, at my tail. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't know if that would work same... with my kids. I would probably need to get like um, one of those dog collars that you put around your dogs <laughs> where it like shocks them if they pass like a certain line. That's like the only way they would listen. Yeah, we've done the same thing in my house. I mean, my cats don't listen, but uh, my girlfriend, she also, she works from home. And yeah, if like my office door is closed or her office door is closed, then it's like, you know, we're focused, we're in the zone, kind of um, leave them, leave each other be. And yeah, just, I think regardless of if you work remote in an office, you know, at a coffee shop, whatever it may be, just kind of like having that work zone where you can, at least this is for me, like, I can't just jump into work at a moment's notice. Like I need, I don't know, a, a dedicated space where I can work. And I think that's true regardless of where you're at. If, it, if that desk is at an office or at your house or, you know, at a dedicated office space that you kind of work at. Um, to me, that's, that's a critical thing of effective remote work. And I think like starting a company today, like, you know, depending on which, you know, what you're doing, if I was to do that, I would probably try to make it remote first. Like I'm thinking also of the savings on things like office space and um, and just the associated costs with that. In Mississippi, it wouldn't be that big a deal at all. But I'm thinking like in particular in San Francisco or New York, those two cities or maybe, you know, some of the more expensive cities in the world, Tokyo. Um, if I were to open a company in, in one of those places, actually, I would probably make it remote first specifically for the reasons of 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 all of. So like I, th I think you're going to. You're going to not only save on the rent and things like that for the actual space, but I feel, I feel like you'd also attract the better engineers. I feel like uh, you, you're, you're not only going to have a wider you know, net, but I feel like a lot of the, the better engineers know that they can get these types of jobs. So like they're out there looking for those types of jobs. Whereas like they're so they're less desperate to just take whatever they want, like whatever they can get they They, they know that they can kind of like, pick and choose the better the better opportunities so i don't know that's just my take on it but i've never actually done built like run my own company or built my own company so i'm just talking shit <laughs> I, I think that's true because i know a few clients who the founder is is is, is, in, is in san francisco because of course you need to be in san francisco these days but the rest of the team and the whole company is not so they are in the netherlands or they are in, in europe or even in asia because and that's for them that's more cost effective and also like you said Mary, it's more uh they're more better for the for the people they want for the specialties they want so yeah i think i think i, I think i would do that too if i would wants to build a, a, a great company yeah so before we kind of wrap things up and get to our picks is there anything else that you feel like we haven't touched on um in this discussion mm, i think we did everything that's or talked about everything that remote and distributed teams have. So plus sides and downsides. <laughs> yeah, like the one thing I kind of haven't really talked about that much, but I think it's pretty interesting and we're seeing a little more of this is like this idea of the digital nomad. Um, uh, Spencer spent like three months or so, maybe more than that or less, I don't know. He, he spent a large amount of time like in an RV, like traveling the United States. That's pretty cool. And then I see people that like my friend Carlos, he is like going to Asia for a few months and he's in New York right now for like a month. And he's like traveling the world, like doing stuff. 
And you see these digital nomads like in, in Asia, a lot of times in some of the less expensive uh, countries. And me, I travel quite a bit for, for work. And, you know, I think that's another interesting thing that you're seeing people do. Like if you can become really good at what you do and you can kind of like land a remote gig, it allows you to travel a lot. But I do know uh, and if that's your thing, if you like doing that. But I do I, I do notice that when I'm traveling, like sometimes it's harder for me to kind of like sit down and get a lot of work done depending on, you know, where I am. Like if, I, if I'm in like a, a city where I know that there's a good co-working space and with high, high speed internet, I can go there and get like four or five hours of work done and be good for the day. But I've also noticed that like, depending on where I am, the internet might not be good or might be distracted by going and being a tourist. But uh, Spencer, when you did that, did you feel like uh, you were able to get as much work done? as you would have. Hell no. Okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. It, I got maybe like 25% of the work done that I would normally do. Um, and yeah, it was the same thing. Like I saw people doing it. And I was like, that's kind of cool. I work remote. Like I'm going to give this a shot. I, my cats are my only dependents. Like they can just come with me. Um, and it, it was a fun experience. And like, I'm grateful that, you know, I work in an industry where I could try that, but yeah, for me personally, being a person who like, I'm very much tied to my workspace. That's, how I get things done. Um, it, it didn't work out for me because it was a, Oh, I'm, you know, an hour away from the grand Canyon, like screw work. I want to go see the grand Canyon or (laughs) even something as simple as like, I need to figure out where I'm going to sleep next week. That there's just, there was a lot more in limbo for me and for my personality type, that was too much to handle in addition to, you know, landing clients or selling courses, that kind of stuff. So, um, awesome opportunity. I would definitely, if I hadn't done it before, I would say do it. But like, yeah, it was, it was a good learning experience to learn that type of remote work is a bit too much for me personally. Yeah. But how, 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 how much did you travel? Did you travel every day or every week or how did that, did that work? Christmas? So we, we typically stayed in each spot for like a week and a half, week oh. and a half, two weeks. Um, if we were doing like a month in a, at a, each point, um, I think that would work. But yeah, the thing with that was, uh, again, looking at the cost of living, like I've lived in Tennessee the last three years, it's a lot cheaper to live here versus, uh, like Las Vegas and LA and Denver, Colorado, which is where we spent a majority of that three months in that area. So it was like the standard of living had to drop quite significantly Mm -hmm. because, uh, just to kind of keep it within our budget. And then also having the cats around, it was, it was, it was an interesting thing. If you don't have dependents, including any pets, I think it's a really easy, fun thing to do. But yeah, as as the dependencies of uh, your life, especially if you have kids, that gets complicated. Props to anyone who does, who who's like those, you know, five years on the road or whatever. Hashtag van life. That's pretty crazy <laughs> stuff. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So uh, I think we'll go ahead and get to the pick. Spencer, do you have any picks today? Yeah. So uh, going off this conversation, one pick I've got is Infinite's Red, Infinite Red's materials on remote work. They've got a bunch of stuff on it because they're a completely remote company or distributed, I think. Um, yeah, they've got a ton of awesome material on there that I would suggest looking at if you want to go deeper on this subject. Um, and then the other thing is kind of a little self promotion. It's a new course I'm putting together called React Native by Example. Uh, It's basically building 10 apps by example. Like I'll I'll just walk through that entire process. I've got three of them out there right now. It's free to go through those first three. Um, And yeah, I just think, you know, putting in the reps is such a valuable thing to learn a new technology that I wanted to put together a resource I could just point people to to do that. Cool. Um, So yeah, where can they learn about your course? What's the URL for that again? Yeah, you can find all my courses at learn.handlebarlabs.com. Got it. Okay, uh, Peter, do you have any picks? I don't have picks, actually. I was frantically trying to put something, but uh, <laughs> I've been heads down. So what about draft just, bit? Like, edit out the part? Huh? <laughs> what about um, a shameless plug for draft bit? Okay, fine. Ask me that question again. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry. Peter, do you have any picks? Yes, I do. Uh, So we recently launched a whole new documentation page for DraftBit. It is fucking sick. Uh, One of my coworkers, Angelo, put it together. It's docs.draftbit.com. 
we don't just teach you how to use DraftBit. We go over Expo and the Expo CLI. We go over uh, flex and spacing and position and how components work. A lot of people have been really excited about the docs because they do a good job of explaining things. Uh, we're also uh, about to launch uh, a few new features like um, navigation and data. So I don't, it'll be a couple of weeks before this episode goes out. So they might even be live by the time people listen to this. So those are like the two big critically acclaimed features that the world is looking uh, towards to looking forward to. Awesome. Um, so Walter, do you have any picks? Um, yeah, well, on this topic as well, I, I think everybody should read the Tourism Signals Remote book. It is also an ebook, of course, which is really great. And how uh, how they how they do remote work, and they have some really really good ground rules how to do it. Uh, and of, and the other one uh, is the, the GitLab playbook, which already was mentioned, which is really great. It is on the GitLab uh, website, yeah, and they are really transparent what they do. Uh, with their company and also with their hiring and and everything they do remote, so those uh, those two are uh, my picks. Um, my pick is actually I have two picks and they're both kind of shameless plugs for some of the video stuff I'm doing. One is uh, follow me on Twitch. I'm twitch.tv slash dabit three, the same dabit three as on Twitter and Medium and GitHub and all that other stuff. I'm going to be doing a live stream on serverless functions in depth this week. I did a live stream last week. I'm going to continue doing a bunch of live streams. And then after those live streams are completed, you can just go to my YouTube channel. And it is, uh, you, my, my YouTube URL is uh, YouTube slash user slash thing matter dabbit. And I'm, I'm uploading my videos there. So um, yeah, if you're interested in any of the stuff that I've been working on, I've been doing a lot more live streaming take the video uh, after the live stream, put it on YouTube. So check it out there. All right. So that wraps up this episode. So thank you for coming on. That was a good and in inter interesting in discussion that we had. Uh, and hopefully we'll have you on again in the future. Yeah. Thank you very much. Nair. That wraps up this episode of React Native Radio. Thanks for listening and we'll see you next week. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com to learn more.